before. Um, there really have been three very separate and distinct conversations going on uh, around the Common Core, and I think it's important to keep this in mind. The first and earliest conversation was really a, a national conversation among political elites in Washington and in state capitals uh, around the Common Core, uh, really distinct from, from kind of everybody else. The, the second uh, conversation that is ongoing, um, it started a little bit late around the Common Core, it really is around educators and administrators talking about how you actually kind of do this work. And the third conversation is really among parents and the general public public. And, and that conversation has really only started uh, more recently, I would say probably in the last year or so, once uh, states have really begun to pilot uh, the Common Core work. Uh, and I think a couple of things are interesting. There was just a University of Connecticut survey that was done um, that asked the question about, do, do you support the idea of national standards? And remarkably, over 70% of Americans uh, support the idea of national standards. And we've actually seen historically pretty strong support for the idea of national standards. When asked if they uh, uh, had heard of the Common Core, however, uh, only 39% of Americans said they'd actually heard of the Common Common Core, uh, which is pretty remarkable. So a majority of Americans haven't even heard of this. Um, among those who have, uh, Democrats uh, support it by a two to one margin um, more over Republicans. But I think what part of what's interesting about this information is that despite all of the buzz, despite all of the writing that you've done on this, the public really remains uh, largely unaware. And I think that that presents a real challenge and an opportunity for, for supporters of the Common Core to go out and do that communication and education work. Common Core has yet to be defined for the majority of Americans, uh, and there's gonna have to be a, a, a large effort to do so, and of course, opponents of the Common Core are working hard to put their own definition out there uh, as well. So I think that's important to keep, to keep in mind here. Um, common Core is a Rorschach test. I think my wife's a psychologist, so I had to kind of put this up there. Um, it, it's interesting, right? I mean, people look at the same Common Core and see very different things, right? Is it, is it an evil monster to be slayed, um, or is it a beautiful butterfly, right, to be, to be cherished. Um, and, and part of the point I want to make about that is that it's also that there's not a single opposition to the Common Core, right? There are lots of different sources of opposition to the Common Core, and I think that's important to understand for the politics of all this, um, not the least of which it's going to be very hard, and it's already proving hard, for these very different uh, sources of opposition to come together in a united front against the Common Core. They oppose it for different reasons. They'd like to see different things happen to it or happen uh, after it, right? Obviously, we have people on the right, Tea Party libertarian types, who really are afraid of this sort of centralization or, or alleged federalization uh, of national standards and view this as a threat to, to local control, to states' rights in education. We have folks who are concerned about privacy and big data and data mining. We have people who fear the privatization of education. This is all about charters and school vouchers at the end of the day, or corporate control or control of wealthy elites, uh, you know, the, the Pearsons, the Gates Foundation, that kind of concern. We have concerns that maybe it's not so much the core, but it's the speed, right, and the cost of the implementation of the core that's problematic for people. And then on the left, we have folks who are really concerned that higher standards and more rigorous assessments, uh, as expected, will actually lead to uh, a drop in scores and particularly particularly an increase in, in those achievement gaps uh, for, for students of color and students in poverty, and what will that then do uh, to, to their educational prospects. Um, really fascinating parallel, if you look back to uh, about almost exactly 20 years ago now, the mid-1990s, you had a Democratic president coming off of a major health care push. This is President Clinton now uh, facing a, a hostile Republican Congress, right, and trying to advance um, national education standards. And, and then, as now, it became really a symbol of an ideological kind of pushback against the, uh, those who oppose kind of big government uh, liberalism run amok. And of course, National uh, Security uh, uh, Agency uh, uh, doesn't help uh, in, in that regard. The war in cyberspace, one of the things that's fascinating about what's going on around the Common Core is how much of the conversation is actually happening in, 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 you know, virtually, right, in, in, in cyberspace, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter. If you haven't checked this stuff out yet, um, it's really pretty fascinating. But it makes it hard to kind of understand who the opposition is, right, and, and again, how, how, who, how many uh, uh, folks really are out there um, uh, opposing, uh, opposing this. To that regard, um, I've had some colleagues who've done a really interesting analysis of Twitter. Right? This is uh, looking at over a seven month period. There were 200,000 tweets just among the top 1% um, of tweeters. Three interesting conclusions around this. Right? One, uh, the three groups are not talking to one another at all. Right, so just talk, proponents are talking to proponents, opponents are talking to opponents, right? It's an echo chamber, right? So the debate, there's not debate happening, there's not learning happening. Uh, people are just talking to people that, that share the same view. The other is a small number of people are generating a very large um, a, amount uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of content here, right? So very interesting to kind of see, 
see what's going on um, with this. Implementation, the good, the bad, the ugly. We have the good here today in, in Tennessee and Kentucky, right? But states really vary in the, the time and effort and resources that, and quality of work that they've put into this. Uh, obviously, Maryland, New York have had really a hard time with this. Implementation matters not just for the impact ultimately the Common Core is going to have on American education. It matters a heck of a lot for the politics of this, particularly uh, in the short term. We have this spring date, spring, summer 2015. The new test results come down. Uh, how and whether states prepare parents and policymakers for the anticipated drop in test scores will be hugely important uh, to Common Core going forward. Just a couple last slides here. Political turnover and ownership of the core. November, we've got elections across the country. 37 governors are up for election. We're going to see big turnover in governor's offices, state education agencies, state departments of, of, of state boards of education, uh, as well as in legislatures. These folks, a lot of them, if they're new, are going to inherit the core. They didn't make a choice to adopt the core. That that may affect uh, their willingness to walk away from it or their willingness to invest us heavily in implementation. Uh, and then I will just end by saying, if I can get the last slide up there. Are they not going to let me get the last slide up there? Ah, good, okay. Teachers, right? Still 75% of teachers support Common Core. 70 plus percent of Amer uh, Americans generally, 75% of teachers. Um, that's a good thing, I think, for the Common Core. But we're increasingly seeing Common Core being attached to assessments, teacher evaluations, accountability systems, and as a result, union opposition is growing, and I think that's a concern. So teachers, principals, key to the politics of this ultimate. Thank you.